Welcome to season two of Small Business Big Lessons, a Buffer Original series. I'm Haley Griffiths and I work at Buffer. And in this podcast, we're bringing you business stories like you've never heard before. We're going behind the scenes with inspirational small businesses to explore how they're questioning the best ways to build a business and uncover the big lessons we can learn from their journeys so far. Last season, we heard from innovative entrepreneurs who are using their businesses to redefine how great work happens. This season, we'll hear from innovative small business owners who are building communities, turning down big money, and proving it's possible to build a successful business while doing good along the way. And within all that, you'll get some added insight from me and Buffer's CEO, Joel Gascoigne. So let's dive in. Do you sometimes feel like the interactions you have with customers online lack a certain personal connection? Perhaps you've released a product or added a feature to your business that wasn't received with the excitement that you were expecting? Whether we're talking about the people who work with you to build your company or the people on the other side of the counter, having a community around your business can play a number of important roles. By building a thriving community around your business, you can discover new and enriching ways of interacting with your audience. And if you sometimes feel as though you're going through the struggles of small business ownership alone, being part of a like-minded community of other founders can be an incredible resource and support system. But how do you go from just having members of staff and customers to having a flourishing community that grows with and supports your business? How do you build that community? And why is it important? My name is Holly Howard, and I run a business consultancy called Ask Holly How, which works with small businesses who are starting a business or looking to grow a business. And I was here on season one, and we were really talking about following your why. Holly Howard has used her culture-first approach to consultancy while working with over 1,000 businesses over the past 10 years. She provides entrepreneurs with the tools they need to grow their businesses while staying true to their purpose. As you heard, Holly joined us for season one, and we're so happy to have her back with us again. This season, you'll hear Holly in every episode, giving us insights from her own experience of working with amazing small businesses. We want to think about company culture as like the soil, right? So if we're planting something that we want to grow, we're growing a business. Our culture is really the soil within which we are planting that company. It provides all of the nourishment. It provides the stability. It is the foundation. And so that's why it is so important. They're not just buzzwords when we think about culture. It really is this thing that regenerates the company over and over again. So we know how important culture and community are to a business. But when should you start thinking about the community you want to build? And where do you start? I am Samantha Anderl, co-founder of Harlow. I'm Andrea Wilt. I'm the other co-founder of Harlow. Harlow is an all-in-one freelance tool. So it is built to help solopreneurs manage their business more confidently. So everything from getting paid to locking in new clients and everything in between. Samantha and Andrea had a vision for the audience at which Harlow was aimed before they even began building the product. So it made perfect sense to them to begin cultivating that community before they started developing their tools. We knew that we were committed to building this product. So for us, it wasn't a question of, are we going to build a product for the freelance community? The question was more, what type of product, what problems do freelancers really need help solving? And the best way to understand that for any organization is to be deeply connected to your community and to your customer. And so it just made sense for us to start connecting with those freelancers early on in order to get that feedback to ensure that we're building what they needed. We really wanted to build trust early on. You know, if you build trust early on, and again, if you build that authority with your community, the more likely that community is to want to take a leap of faith and try out what you're offering or the product that you're building or get involved or share your story. When we launched Harlow, we already had this community who knew who we were. We had been communicating with them. We had been establishing trust. We had been building connections and all these meaningful relationships. And that allowed us, you know, when we finally did launch, we had a bunch of people, you know, rooting for us and cheering us on and being really excited about what we're building and what we're trying to help solve. 
Hey, I'm Hugh, one half of Painter. Hey, I'm Becky, the other half of Painter. Um, we were lucky enough to be on season one of the podcast and we're super happy to be back. In a short amount of time, Becky and Hugh have built a community around their business which is unmatched. Their dedicated fan base ensures that their jackets sell out within minutes of being launched. And Becky and Hugh's commitment to their principles shows that you can build a wild success story without compromising your integrity. For painter jackets, intentionality is so important when building their community. Having a group of people buying your products or a large following on Instagram doesn't necessarily mean you have a community in the true sense. And it's not really even about those levels of engagement, rather it's the nature of that engagement that counts. And the ways in which folks interact can be unique to every business. It's really easy to mix up having an audience with having a community, but we think that they are two really different things. You can have a community and feel so part of something, and I think it's all about how engaged you are with, with that brand or that business. Some brands have like really natural communities because it's based on their industry, like a sports brand. They might have a running club or anything really with a physical presence um, where people get together. It's going to be a really natural thing that there's a community around that business. But I think for us as an online clothing brand, it's not going to happen unless we really, really invest and we and we try and work for it. So I think building a community for us was super important from the beginning. Working in public was a huge part of doing that. If you're interested in the practice of building in public and you haven't listened to Painter's episode in season one of this podcast, I highly recommend you do so. It's episode number three. But in the meantime, here's a brief description of the process from Becky. It basically means like sharing your learnings as you go and being really open to putting yourselves out there. If things go wrong, that's not a problem. That's probably actually quite interesting to share. We've shared all our learnings really from before we made our first product and before we launched. Everything we do has like very personal connection because we're a really small company. There's just two of us and we love being really involved. Part of what makes Becky and Hugh's building in public so successful is how much of themselves they put into what they do. As we spoke to more amazing businesses for this season, we noticed a pattern emerging where the more of themselves the founders put into their public presence, the more audiences connected with them and ultimately, the more fulfilled those business owners feel. Z at Rise Up Bakery epitomizes this approach. Hello, my name is Ezekwe Anderson. I am the head baker and owner of Rise Up Bakery in San Francisco, California. Ezekwe, or Z to his friends, is a passionate advocate for putting your whole self into your business. He bakes his love for what he does into his bread, and his enthusiasm and energy are inspiring. The purpose behind my business is the same purpose that is behind me, which is trying to make the world a better place. This is one of the first things I've ever done in my entire life where I really feel seen, where I feel like my own individuality resonates with people and that they're excited to follow my story. And because of that, it it's very freeing. So if I'm doing something that I'm really enjoying, I just tend to like document it and put it out there. And what do you know? Other people are enjoying it too. The thing that I think I love most about this entire project is the act of making bread and solving problems and trying to be creative makes me really happy. And then all of that hard work makes other people really happy. So it's this really cool feedback loop of positivity. I wanna make people feel good. I like to feel good. I wanna spread that love. I wanna spread those vibes. So a majority of the stuff that I put up, it's not really like preconceived. I just, I'm having a good time. And so I show people what I'm doing. What up, y'all? I'm back at it. Have my rest, my relaxation. And now, bada bing, bada bang, back to it. Uh, going to Hey Neighbor right now. Gonna drop off the hella black. And uh, just say what's up. Hope y'all guys have a happy holiday. I feel like it's a thing that we miss about being in the room with people. Is there are vibes and you really can feel how people are feeling, whether or not you want to acknowledge it, whether or not you tap into it. But when you look into someone's eyes or you see their smile, who they really are stands out. Here's Holly again to talk about the importance of in-person interactions in an online world. 
I've been talking a lot about this idea of thinking beyond the feed, meaning like beyond the social media feed, and the idea that in-person is still so valuable. And it's always a mixture of both, right? We have online interactions and we have in-person, but as online became the new thing and digital advertising and data sort of promised us certainty of understanding, we sort of swung the pendulum a little bit too far online and we really neglected the in-person experience. So how can you create opportunities for in-person interactions with your community? Z has found that selling at local farmers markets is an incredible way to meet face-to-face -face with his customers and create meaningful connections. This is an experience shared by Sheena at Made With Local. My name is Sheena Russell, and I am the founder and CEO of Made With Local, and we're a Canadian snack foods company that creates the most delicious, nourishing foods that have social impact baked in. Sheena is an incredible businesswoman with boundless energy, a passion for community, and with huge ambition for growing her company. Just the culture of farmer's market vendors and the hustle and bustle of it all was just so energizing. And we would then have the privilege of being a couple feet away from hundreds and hundreds of our most diehard customers, our OG community that has been buying from us right from the earliest days. What's the easiest way to connect directly with people and have the interactions where you matter to them and they matter to you, right? It's not to take away the ease of Amazon and I don't, don't get me wrong, if I need something, whoop, it'll show up, you know? But that doesn't have a soul. That's not an exchange, right? When I go and I buy jam or preserves from the lady that made it from the tree that she has five of and, you know, she's worked at it and I taste them, I can taste the love. And so I wanted to be a part of that and I wanted it to be a major part of what we do. I look back on our farmer's market days so fondly because it was just such a special time for us at Made With Local. We were set up at a little five foot table up against the back wall of this big, beautiful farmer's market. And our little table was covered in like a red and white gigam check print tablecloth. And we had a little chalkboard where we had, you know, what we brought that day and our pricing and wooden or wicker baskets full of these handmade and hand wrapped granola bars. All right, y'all. I'm out here at West Oakland Market. I'm out here. Uh, better get out here before I sell out. We are Our farmer's market setup has just have a massive upgrade. I worked with um, the artist who had uh, won a competition for us to design our tote bag. His name is Nick Soderich. And um, he completely knocked it out of the park. So now we have this beautiful brown slash gold uh, tent. We've got our two tables with our little black covers over the top. And then we have a full outlay of like, you know, six or eight of each of the loaves all stacked. And most people walk by and they're like, oh, what are you about? And then as soon as they start to read the flavors, they're like, what, what, huh, what? And we could just hang out, right? We could talk about how's your family, you know, see the kids grow up over months and years and get very real-time feedback about the product too, right? It was always nice to have a chit-chat, but I really, you know, would love for them to share with me, you know, how they're using our products to fuel their life and hearing their feedback about new flavors or pricing or what else is happening in the market that maybe we could, or any other collaborators in the market that we could be partnering with. It was just such a really important time in the formation of Made With Local. And then also the other side of it is when I had a gentleman and he was like, yo, your bread's kind of expensive. And I'm like, it is, you know? And he was like, oh, I've never, I've never seen that before. I said, well, how about this? How about you buy it? If you don't like it, come back. I'll give you your money back. And he came back the next week and he was like, actually, it's the best bread I've ever had. And I couldn't believe that I would actually say that, but I would buy this every week. I don't need to eat any other kind of bread. And I was like, well, that's saying something, right? So those kind of exchanges to me, they make all the hard work worth it, you know? I just am so grateful for that time. Yeah, it was an incredible, you know, first two years to to get our feet under us. And like I said, I kind of joke, <laughs> this is a terrible pun, but, you know, the market research that we were able to do at the farmer's market with all of those customers that came by and bought bars every Saturday, it's totally invaluable, right? I think we have a very clear view of exactly who our customers are at Made With Local. I don't think we'd be where we are today without having that foundation built of deep community connection. 
at the farmer's market. Here's more from Holly. The number one piece of advice I give about improving our community of customers is approaching it through a lens of curiosity. I don't think business owners are often curious enough about who's on the receiving end of their product or their service, especially in the digital era where we sometimes minimize things to transactions and conversions and all of these technical terms. You know, there's a human being on the other end and we can be a lot more curious about who they are and what their psychographics are, meaning what their habits and their values and their hopes and their dreams are. Now, what if you don't sell a physical product? Or, like Painter, you don't hold physical stock of your product. How can you create opportunities to meet with your community? Well, your face-to-face -face encounters don't have to revolve around selling. Here's Becky to tell us how Painter brings people together. Painter at the pub was something that started after batch number one. It was a bit of an anti-Black Friday event. We thought, instead of having a sale or trying to sell anything, let's just bring people together and let's do it physically this time. It would be so nice, not just for us to meet our customers, but for our customers to meet each other. You didn't have to have a jacket to come. Like Everyone was welcome, whether you were just part of the community on our newsletter or following on Instagram and kind of intrigued. It was supposed to be for a couple of hours, but we were there all day and it was absolutely incredible. At one stage we had a table of olive green chore jackets and then we had a, a table of navy chore jackets and another table of Bill's blue chore jackets, which was amazing and, and eventually everyone did really mix up as well. One guy brought a dog and I think he left with six girls numbers. <laughs> that was pretty memorable. And people came from as far as Bournemouth and South Wales and obviously a lot of people from London too. And we have since done another one actually in New York. We did one over in Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Inn. That was incredible. And we met customers that we were so familiar with from Instagram and also from email and felt like old friends but had never really actually met them face to face. But when they came in, it was like, hey, Adrienne, because we could recognize her from her Gmail icon. It was just really, really special to put faces to names, to have a really good chat for customers to meet each other. It was something that we want to do a lot more of. I think being online, even though we're both fairly introverted and like we pick and choose the things that we want to give lots of energy to, this is definitely something we really want to do. And so we're going to do another one in London in the next few months. And we're super excited. It's not such a strategic thing. It's not like, oh, we're releasing a product. Like everyone come, we're going to release this product and you can like buy it on the day. But it's the most unstrategic thing ever, which is everyone come for a drink and let's have a chat. It's the simplest thing, but a lot of people get so much out of it. You just get people who'd lived on the street from each other and all of a sudden they get to meet. And it's just for us, that's the benefit. It's other people meeting each other. It's literally, hello and let's chat and let's all meet and see what we get from this. And it was very special, and we'll definitely keep doing it. As a business, your outward-looking relationships are only part of the story of your community. The internal interactions that happen within your company and the culture that you cultivate are just as important in building a cohesive vision of what your community can be. Here's Holly again. The internal company culture and the external community, they should mirror each other. So the word I use is congruency. There should be congruency between the culture we create internally and the community that we cultivate externally. Should be the same experience. I like to say employees can't deliver an experience they don't receive. So if we're selling this experience to our community outwardly, to our customers, we want to make sure we're delivering the same experience internally, actually. Kelly at Destination Unknown came up with an awesome way to transform the culture within the service staff at her restaurants. My name is Kelly Phillips from Destination Unknown Restaurants. We have four different concepts in the Washington, D.C. area. Kelly is a trailblazer who is upending traditional models of how staff are paid in her restaurants. She's creating a new way to put the people who work in her restaurants first, transforming the customer experience for the better. At Destination Unknown Restaurants, we really wanted to be able to offer our workers uh, stability with their income. They come to work, they should be paid as a professional and make what they expect to make every week. Kelly turned the traditional idea of how service jobs are paid in the U.S. on its head with amazing results. We have a professional wage model where full-time workers are offered a salary with a bonus incentive. 
This differs from a traditional wage model where workers don't know what they're going to make and their pay is based on tips. With tipping, you know, the servers are really at the mercy of guests and what they feel comfortable leaving. You know, they're at the whims of the weather, what section they have in the restaurant. So we choose to have a more stable model where workers can really count on their salary, they know what they're gonna make, and they are incentivized by our bonus structure, which is a monthly bonus based on good reviews. The effects of this new wage model have been clear. We've noticed um, a better quality of life for people and they work as a team. This encourages a team environment where servers are helping each other because they want to get good reviews because that's what their bonus is based on. But they also, with guests, they're not as concerned with tipping. So they want to make sure their guests are having a good time so that they come back so that the restaurant is busy all the time. I am Ari Weinzweig. I'm one of the co-founding partners of Zingerman's Community of Businesses, which is in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And it's my second time on this podcast, and I'm excited to be back. Ari has been thinking of new ways to do business for over 40 years. And his experience in building Zingerman's Community of Businesses in that time is a masterclass in building with integrity and staying true to your purpose. I think there's a lot of beliefs out in the world, or certainly in the Western world, and certainly in the American part of the Western world, it's about self-made humans, self-made man, whatever. And I have come to realize that's not only untrue, it's impossible. We're all products of a community. And so understanding that we can either then be passive about the community, or we can embrace that that's the reality and then try to make it as healthy as possible, which means better connections, being conscious of the energy we put into the community, the dignity we bring to every interaction, the purposefulness that we bring into every interaction, and that the healthier the community, the healthier we are, and the healthier we are, the healthier the community will be. The variation between workplace cultures can be vast, and they can make all the difference to how much we enjoy our work and our business. Here's Z with a great example. I felt like when I did more chefing, there was like this weird competitiveness, right? Where it was like, you know, I do what you do, I'm better than you. And it's not really like, that wasn't ever really said, but you could kind of feel it was different. And so when I first started making bread, I didn't think to ever ask anybody for help or see how they did it because I thought like it's going to be more kind of the way it is with chef. You would never go into a kitchen and be like, hey, how do you do this thing? You know, they'd be like, "Ah, get out of here. You know, like this, that's our thing, you know, but in baking, it's completely different. I like this MO better. I, I feel like everyone who bakes knows how hard it is. And so if you do it, it's like, hey, you do what I do. I know how hard it is, right? It's not like I'm better than you. It's a like a we're all on a like a journey, right? Sheena often talks about how impact and community are baked into her business. And she's found a beautiful way to simultaneously build her business and lift up her community. The Flower Cart Group was our very first social enterprise bakery partner here at Made With Local. And we started working with them back in 2014 when I became pregnant with my first daughter, Ruthie, who's going to be eight this summer. She, you know, was getting bigger and bigger in my belly and it was getting harder for me to be able to make our bars on my own because my belly was literally getting in the way. So we enlisted the help of this incredible organization here in Nova Scotia called the Flower Cart Group that employs adults experiencing barriers to the mainstream workforce in some way. And they engage and train those adults in in different work programs, including in a bakery. And this is the peanut butter blondie with peanut butter and lots of big milk chocolate chunks. Tina's just putting that love in there. <laughs> we were growing uh, quickly in 2014, and so was my belly, like I mentioned, and we needed help to be able to make more of our bars uh, to keep up with demand. And that was where this beautiful partnership with the Flower Cart Group really started. Back in 2014, we were doing a couple hundred bars a week with them. Fast forward, you know, long ways, eight years to today where we've grown in lockstep with them and built out an incredible program that employs dozens of adults living with different barriers to the mainstream workforce and making many tens of thousands of bars every month. 
It's been a really cool partnership on so many levels, but it really for us was the way that we could scale our business while staying true to these values of taking every opportunity we can to create positive social impact. And it really is true. We bake social impact into the fabric of Made With Local through these community bakery partnerships, through our partnerships with farmers and food producers. And it's a totally unique model that we haven't found, uh, you know, any other brands in the world really using this exact model that we use. The way Sheena has grown her business is truly inspirational, and we'll be looking more closely at how Made With Local has grown in later episodes. So far, we've looked at communities on both sides of the counter, but there are other types of connections that can be incredibly valuable to entrepreneurs. And these are the connections we can make between businesses. A sense of community with other like-minded businesses can provide support, be that moral, emotional, or in terms of sharing knowledge and resources or providing inspiration. Another Black-owned business, that's my jam. We've been working on some behind the scenes things and uh, some like pairings to have their jams kind of like augment and go with some of the flavors that we've been working on, like the masala loaf. They're making us of kind of like lemon mango chutney to go with it as a counterpoint to the kind of like heat of it. And so they were part of a two woman crew that put on a really nice black entrepreneur dinner last night. And so you had like influencers and bloggers and chefs and bakers and like all these people that occupy this space. And we just all got together and had amazing food that was all uh, with wine pairings. And it was just really nice to be a part of a community because I spent a majority of my time in a place that doesn't have any windows with my own personal little family that I've chosen and taught. And so we're trying to do these great things, but a lot of times we work so long that we're not out in the world being a part of the community. We're, we're a part of the community because we feed the community. We're a part of the community because we care and because we raise funds to like, you know, feed homeless. But a lot of my actual days are spent here. You know, I'm not out doing a lot of publicity outside. So just sitting shoulder to shoulder with other people that are trying to make a difference was really, really cool. I think if you don't have the community there and you come into hard times, it makes them even harder. In hard times, your community is the wind in your sails. It's what gets you through, it gets you through the choppy waves. It's like, and we make it through the other side. Like I had one time where our refrigerator, or actually all of our power went down. And um, I was really nervous I was gonna lose all of our bread. And I had uh, a gentleman who I had never met at all, the owner of Rosalind Bakery, and said, hey, you know, if you need to come down, we'll open our house to you. You can come and bake all your loaves so you don't lose them. And I just was like, how cool is that? You know, just through Instagram, seeing that I was having a problem, he was like, hey, I know what it's like. Why don't you come down? We'll help you. And it it like made me feel really cared for. And, and that kind of community is something I'm, you know, makes you want to do that same thing for other people, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I feel definitely cared for and seen, and I feel like the wave of what I can do because other people want to be a part and also are excited to see me grow, like even my competitors, you know, like other people that do exactly what I do are like, man, we're proud of you. I was like, oh, like that feels super cool, you know? jackets that we've done have even been named after a street not far from where we are because there's a deli there with the most incredible founder Fran she's an absolutely amazing community builder she gives the best service she knows everyone's name whether they just walk past the cafe every day or if they actually order Um, and she really genuinely cares and so we thought well we love Wilton Way Deli let's put it on the label of our car coat Let's actually illustrate that place and celebrate that story and make a guide about that street and what makes it so special for people visiting London. It's not just the relationship that we have with our community, but also introducing them to other fantastic businesses that we're really excited by and that we think their stories are worth shouting about and celebrating. As with so many of the topics we'll be looking at in this series, the key to building a unique and thriving community around your business starts with visioning, and defining your company values. This is something we'll be discussing more in later episodes. The number one piece of advice I would give to a small business looking to improve their culture would be to ensure that your values are clearly defined and that nobody else define your values for you. 
So when we think about our company values and we think about our purpose statement, they really have to come from our own personal internal motivations. They can't be something that we sort of like focus group out. They really have to be something that we've put a lot of thought into and that have a personal motivation for us. Made with Local has been started since day one with a bigger purpose than just making snacks or just the bottom line. There's such a bigger purpose behind partnering with people in your community to bring beautiful foods into the world. And that's something that we've been doing since the very beginning. So our purpose at Zingerman's is embedded in our mission statement. It talks about making as many lives better as we possibly can. And so that's ultimately really what we're here to do. On the one hand, it's it's awesome and inspiring to have this bigger purpose, but it's equally important to simply make every interaction, whether it's talking to you or greeting somebody at a desk when I'm a customer and make it as purposeful as possible in order to bring beauty and kindness and dignity into the world with every tiny interaction. We start by defining the bigger picture vision and making sure that the culture is clear. And those two things are really important, right? So our vision tells us where we're going and who we're going to become as a company. And our culture really tells us why we're doing what we're doing and how we're doing what we're doing. So that's our purpose and our values. And we want to have that foundation laid before we try to solve any other problem within our business, because all of those problems really stem from understanding what the foundation is that we laid first. I think the best advice I have for building a community is building it before you're even ready, before you have a product, before you have a launch date in mind. Start building it. It will start from zero. I will start from zero. It's gradually built over time. Like start with family and friends, get them signed up and then get their family and friends signed up and build it on Instagram or whatever social media platform that you're comfortable with. But ultimately get people signed up to a newsletter because we found that that's where you can really take your time to to tell longer stories. You're not trying to beat an algorithm. You can actually go into depth about the development and ideas behind a product, why you're even in business. And we've seen that that's what's worked best for us. If you're a small business owner, then you know that nothing great comes without hard work. And building your community is no different. It takes time, effort and careful consideration to build a community, but then it also takes a significant amount of motivation and work to maintain those connections and ensure that you're giving back and not just taking from your community. I think there's just different challenges, right? It's just honoring the ecosystem in which we're present and doing the best that we can. We're highly imperfect here at Zingerman's, but I really believe that if one writes a vision, in essence, a story of their own choosing of your future, and in there you describe the culture that you want to create, and then you commit to doing the work, the odds are pretty high you'll get close. And I think that's true if you have four people on staff, and it's true with 400. You have to spend a lot of time investing in the community as well. You can't just like build a big community and just go quiet and hope that one day they'll come back and help out. It's like you have to give. You have to somehow use that community's knowledge and kind of like provide value. We've really learned how important it is to start by listening and to start by advocating and by honestly just being kind of selfless, right? So you have to give in order to get when you're first building your community. It's so important up front to establish that trust and that authority. And you really can't do that unless you spend the time listening. I feel like I can't stress that enough that you can't go into building community just from the perspective of what am I gonna get out of it? It really does need to be more of a selfless act of how can I connect? How can I listen? How can I help? What resources can I provide? And that's where I think you're able to build the more robust and meaningful connections with people. None of this is easy. It never has been easy. And if we're just like whatever metaphor you want to use, running a marathon, raising a child, writing a book, like none of them are glamorous every day. It's a lot of work over a long period of time. But when it's work you embrace and believe in and are willing to put yourself out there, it goes a lot better. In this episode, we've heard from incredible business owners about how they've built their strong communities, both in person and online. By showing you the unique paths each entrepreneur has taken to get where they are, 
we've illustrated the many different ways in which it's possible to make connections and build a community. As we've seen, the key to building great communities can't be found in a one-size-fits-all piece of advice. Rather, it comes from careful consideration, focusing on a people-first approach, and having a vision for the business and the community that you want to build. In the next episode, we're going to be looking at how some business owners have done something that a lot of others might never do, turning down big money. We'll look at why they made their decisions and how different ways of funding your business can radically change the ways in which you operate. Thank you so much for joining us for this first episode in season two of Small Business Big Lessons. We are so happy to be back. We're so excited to share all of these episodes with you, all of these learnings from these incredible small business owners who have given us their time and their insights. Join us for more conversations about this episode, about guests, and about building your own community at buffer.com slash community. We would love to see you there, and I'll see you in the next episode. This episode of Small Business Big Lessons was written and produced by Rowan Bishop at Message Heart, script edited by me, Haley Griffiths at Buffer, and interviews were conducted by Umber Bhatti at Buffer. Be sure to subscribe to Small Business Big Lessons on your preferred podcast platform to keep up with the latest episodes. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please feel free to leave us a review. 